This video is about the law of induction and Maxwell's equations. So previously we looked at the law of induction and how a time-dependent magnetic flux creates an EMF and therefore a current in a conductor. But EMF and current are effects of an electric field. So neither of them could be in that conductor without an electric field also being present. Previously, we also studied about how the connection between potential differences and electric fields. So we can find the potential difference by integrating the electric field, or we can find the electric field by differentiating the potential function. We can't apply that to this kind of EMF, however. This field is not generated by stationary charges. It's not connect created by free charges. The field lines don't have beginnings. They don't have ends. There's no place that we can possibly start and stop an integration to calculate a potential difference. So really, in this induction case, is the one time when an EMF is not the same thing as a potential difference. Another way to visualize this difference is to think about the nature of the current that flows in a conductor. We call them eddy currents because they flow in closed continuous loops without any sort of current or EMF source. So our currents are closed continuous loops Therefore, the field lines driving the current must also be closed continuous loops. So what this means is that the EMF can't be calculated by the conventional integral from point to point. It must be calculated by a path integration like that used in Ampere's law. So what that means is this is a better representation of the law of induction. The path integral of the field around a closed loop is equal to the rate of change of the magnetic flux passing through that closed loop. When we discuss Ampere's law, we use the Kelvin-Stokes theorem to convert the path integral into a surface integral or a flux calculation. What the Kelvin-Stokes theorem tells us is that the path integral of any vector field is equivalent to the area integration of the curl of that field. So it gives us an integration over area that looks very much like a flux calculation. We know the definition of flux is this integral of b dot dA over an entire surface. However, the law of induction features the derivative of the flux with respect to time. So what we have to do is to do that flux integration and then differentiate it with respect to time afterwards. Or, if our vector field has a nice property called doubly differentiable, which means that it's well behaved and our coordinate system isn't time dependent, then because our integration is over respect to coordinates and our differentiation is over respect to time, that means that we can swap the order of them. And of course, when that happens, we end up with a partial derivative with respect to time rather than a complete derivative with respect to time. Now, if I equate that back to the Kelvin-Stokes theorem applied to the uh, path integral of, of E, what I end up with is two integrals over the same surface A that are equivalent to each other. And the only way those two integrals can be equivalent to each other is if the integrands are equivalent to each other. So here is the more common representation of the law of induction, that the curl of the electric field is equal to the partial of the magnetic field with respect to time. What this is telling us is any time there's a time-dependent magnetic field, it creates an electric field. 
We started studying the law of induction by looking at the effects that these induced fields have on conductors. But what this is telling us is that these, induce, these induction fields are there whether there's a conductor or not. Any time-dependent magnetic field creates an electric field. In the 1860s, James Clerk Maxwell realized that this should work in both directions. That if there is a time-dependent electric flux, it should create a magnetic field. And so he added a second term to Ampere's law. Previously, when we studied Ampere's law, we talked about the path integral of B being equivalent to the magnetic field constant U0 times the current passing through the area bounded by that path. Now we add the second term called the displacement current which is related to the rate of change of flux through that area A. Applying the Kelvin-Stokes theorem gives us this differential form of Ampere's law. Sometimes this is referred to as um, Ampere-Maxwell's law. So let's summarize the four things that we've learned about electric, electric and magnetic fields throughout the semester. The first thing we learned was Gauss's law, which related the flux through a closed surface to the charge enclosed. We were able to apply the divergence theorem to get the differential form. So the divergence of the electric field is related to the volume charge density in that location. When we learned about magnetic fields, we learned that because of the absence of magnetic monopoles, there are no start and stop to the magnetic field lines, which means if we evaluated the magnetic flux through any closed surface, it would be identically zero. An equivalent differential way to discuss that is that the divergence of the magnetic field must always be zero. We have the Maxwell-Ampere law that we just discussed a few moments ago, and we have the law of induction. So knowing these four equations and Lorentz force law are the only things that we need to understand classical electromagnetic fields.